You're listening to The Rich Life Revolution with me, Michelle Cooper. My mission is to empower you to step into your next level of wealthy. You'll hear all the deets, a little bit of inspiration, and real life takeaways so that you can create your own rich life revolution. Let's dig in. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rich Life Revolution. I am your host, Michelle Cooper. And today we are talking once again to Marie Elizabeth Malley, who has come back to the show to talk about reaching alignment in your life. What does that mean? Well, you may have heard about alignment. That may be a word that resonates with you or not. That's okay too. But what Marie Elizabeth reminds us all is that alignment is not an absolute. And she's going to dive into this in this episode. I feel like this is really important. The other thing that she, like a genius, like such a genius here, you may have heard about those more old fashioned or conventional naming of our life stages as women, maiden, mother, crone. These are these multi-year phases of a woman's life that can define who we are. And I never liked these. They didn't resonate with me. I actually rejected them. I didn't like maiden. It felt weak. It felt weird. Mother, okay, sure. But there was a lot of years that I had no intention of being a mother. And crone, well, who wants to be known as a crone? That sounds like some withering old lady. Marie Elizabeth has introduced three new stages, which I adore, and she is going to dive deep into and educate us so that we can step into really embodying these stages and living in alignment. I hope you enjoy this episode, and I would love to hear all about it afterwards. Hey, Marie Elizabeth, so good to see you again. Welcome to the Rich Life Revolution. I am so glad to be back. Thank you, Michelle. Awesome. Today, we are diving in to something that you call the arc of an aligned life, which I adore. Okay. Like, I love that. That is my goal. It has been, I don't think I've kind of thought about it in that way, but it has been over the past couple of years to become more and more aligned with myself and what I truly desire to experience, right? For sure, this year has pushed me outside my comfort zone in aligning with, you know, what I want, what I desire, but also like the limitation that comes up when we think, oh, is that too much? I remember in August, I was in Croatia, spent two weeks on a yacht. It was amazing. And I actually said, life can't get better than this. And then I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Cancel, delete. Cancel, delete. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I caught myself, but I had already said it. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, there's my upper limit. So please share with us, bring people into this concept that you share of the arc of an aligned life. I can't wait to hear all about it. So the first piece that I want to share about it is kind of the overall idea, because alignment isn't a static thing. The word seems kind of static, like you're either aligned or you're not in a certain way. However, what changes over the course of a life is what that alignment looks and feels like. Because what alignment feels like to a 20-year-old is different than what it feels like to a 40-year-old, to a 60-year-old, to an 80-year-old. And so the first piece that I want our listeners to get is that it's a moving, fluid thing. And like you said, the last couple of years you've been working on aligning, that's completely accurate because that the target shifts. It's kind of like balance also. Balance is one of those words that's put out there as a static thing. 
But in truth, balance is constantly shifting because what's balanced when you're in a launch as a business owner looks different than what's balanced when you're on vacation. <laughs> you know, so, so I want people to first get this idea of alignment being a movable target according to where we are at. We're the constant part. And even us as the constant part changes all the time, right? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember I heard somebody say that balance is a moment in time. Yes. And I was like, oh, okay. So that makes sense to me. Right. And I see alignment. I used to see it as very black and white. Like I'm either aligned or I'm misaligned. And it's like, we're either doing this or we're not. And I see it differently now. And I also see that you know, at different stages of my life, I'm aligned with different things. Yes. Yes, exactly. Or different ways of being or experiences. I have different priorities. And it's really helped me not have judgment, judgment of myself or other people. 100%. And that's really where I wanted to begin was this understanding of alignment being something that changes over time because our priorities change over time. So the focus really needs to be on what are my priorities? Like what, what matters most to me now? And once we answer that, then we can look at, okay, what actions align with that, that I'm currently doing and what actions don't that I need to shift. But it starts with our priorities. It starts with who I be now. And so I've identified three distinct eras or, or segments of life where it's important to ask ourselves, what would be most aligned here? Because many of us wait for a crisis. Many of us wait. It's just human nature. When things are fine, we tend to not examine a whole lot. But when things start to go to hell, everything starts falling apart, then we get very curious about what's going on. So my invitation is also to be preemptive about it, to actually answer these questions in a time where it's not a crisis, so that when the crisis shows up, because it will, because life is life, you're ready for it. You have some solidity to stand on as you face this new challenge. So I think that's the other important thing is don't wait to ask these questions of yourself till the crisis. Do it now. And if you're in a crisis, start now. But if you're not in a crisis, start now. <laughs> so, same answer. Just start now. Just start now <laughs> in a nutshell. So the first section of life that I want to talk about alignment with is our youth. And I call this time for women, I call this time being in our pretty body. And what the pretty body is it's really our conditioned self. So it's the young part of our lives till let's say about 35, maybe older for some folks, but it's that young part of life where we're adulting, you know, we're starting to go out to the world, we're adulting for the first time, we want to do really well at our job, we want to please our parents, we want to meet a partner who is acceptable, you know, that, that, that we're fulfilling the wishes of our parents and things like that. Like we're trying to be good girls. It's kind of like the good girl era. And the reason I call it the pretty body is at that time in our youth, very often we're trading on our looks as a certain kind of currency. You know, it's the currency that's kind of traded in the world, youth, beauty, appearance, how we dress, all of that is very primary. And it's also, it's a big focus at that time, right? As you come through those teenage years and you hit your 20s. And like, if I think back to that, I was in university and working and going to the gym and going out to clubs and all these things. And there was a huge emphasis for me, at least on what I look like. Yep. And that's right. I want to really stress that that's right for that time. And what the guy on my arm looked like too. Yes. That really mattered to me a lot. I had to have like the guy, like the popular guy. And the guy I had was, right? So there was a lot of self-worth, I think, that was packed into that. And it's packed into that externalized perception, like how we are being seen by others. That's what's super important in this first stage of adult life 
is like, how am I being perceived? Do people like me? Am I successful? It's very much, our worth is very much determined by the outside. And there's a whole lot of doing. So if we talk about life as a balance of doing and being, in the pretty body stage of life, again, this is about the first third, say, of life, there's a lot of doing and there's less being, meaning there's less self-inquiry, there's less uh, slowing down and focusing on alignment, for example, or really just vibrationally, who are we being? Like those questions are not as active yet. And so I really want to stress that that's, that's what's aligned for that age. Sometimes when we get older and we look back and we're like, oh my God, like if I had just figured this stuff out back then, my life would be great. I was just about to say that, to be honest. <laughs> but it, I don't think that's what that time is for. A spiritual teacher once a long time ago said, you have to have an ego before you can dismantle it. And this pretty body stage is the, and our childhood childhood, you know, childhood and early adulthood is when we form the ego. It's when we form our sense of self. So you don't want to skip that. Let me tell you, I did kind of skip that. And I did a lot of dismantling very early in my life. And now it's biting me in the butt. So the aligned thing is to be squarely in your ego and thinking that's who you are. Don't worry, <laughs> there'll be an awakening later. But at that time, that's what life's about. And so, yes, we can look back without judgment and go, oh my God, I was so concerned about how I looked, how my, you know, how my boyfriend, girlfriend looked, you know, like, et cetera. Now, then at some point in the second third of life, we hit a moment of reckoning. And this can look like if you're a mom, maybe your kids are either nearing or have gone off to school and you suddenly have time for yourself. Or if you're working hard and you've been really climbing that ladder and getting successful, all of a sudden you might be bored or you might realize, oh my God, I've worked so hard to build this business and I actually don't really like it. I'm not into it anymore. Or I don't even know if I like my spouse. Do I want to be married? Like all these, the, your discontent begins to arise. And again, this is normal. And it's a sign. I like to say your discontent is an ally. It's your friend. Because it's, a, it's showing you a place where you have unexpressed desires and unexplored desires. And that's a beautiful thing to do. Like that's, thank you, discontent, for showing me that there's stuff that I'm not listening to in here, in me. And so in the second stage, which I call the passion body stage, so the first stage is pretty body, the second stage is passion body, what we're being called to is to activate our passion and our purpose at a deeper level. So when the discontent arises, instead of going out and blowing money on a sports car or having an affair or any of the number of things that we typically do to blow up our life. My invitation is to go in and down inside first so that you actually know what you want to blow up. If you just blow up out of reactivity, it gets messy. But if you actually do the inner piece first to figure out who you are now, what you want now, who am I beyond the conditioning of what my parents and society taught me to be? When you have answers for that question, then you can look at your life and go, oh, I want this, don't want that, want this, don't want that. And that's the new alignment. And then you start actually bringing your life into alignment with who you are now. And this happens anywhere between 35, 40 to 55, 60, really, you know, even up to 65. It all depends kind of everybody matures at different rates, right? So, but this is the passion body stage. And this is the stage that I'm most engaged in working with currently. I'm 57. So it's the stage that I'm most active in myself. Yeah. I love how you say that discontent is your friend. Because I think so often people feel like they feel that discontent, it expresses itself as frustration or um, dissatisfaction, or, you know, some people will, 
you know, blow up their life just because they're bored. I've definitely had my fair share at that. And, you know, I think a lot of people can look at this discontentment and think, well, this is just how it is, right? Or I guess this is what happens in life, right? You get to this point and this is just, you didn't do the things you wanted to do and, or it, this doesn't totally feel right, but just keep going. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think there is a prevailing narrative about midlife that it's like, it's all downhill from here. Your sunset years. Oh God, right? <laughs> I just do not believe that. I don't believe that. To me, there's so much power and agency and excitement available in midlife because hopefully by now you care a bit less about what people think. That external focus from the pretty body third of life can now be reclaimed and you're sourcing your worth from inside. You're beginning to balance your doing and your being. Part of why you're doing that is you don't have the same energy level that you did when you were young. So you need to be a little more judicious with how you spend your energy. But again, that's a good thing. You get to be more discriminating and choosy at this time. You learn to say no to certain things at this time. All of that's great. And that sets you up to have the most amazing last third of your life, whatever age that tends to be. So I love that you brought that up because there is a certain passivity, like as a passiveness that I see among women in this stage where it's like, oh, the hormones. And it's like, no, 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 no. Yes, make sure your hormones are taken care of, you know, whatever way makes sense to you. Take care of your body. And it's not all downhill from here at all. I read over and over again, like women in their 70s are having the best sex of their life. Why? Because they don't give a shit anymore <laughs> about, they're not all hung up about how they look. They're just in, having a good time. And if you end up having a body that's not very able, as you get older, you can still find ways to enjoy your life. So if we do this middle passion body piece, where we activate our passion and purpose at the time when, when it's really time to do that, that sets us up to age into what I call the radiant body. So pretty body, youth, passion body, middle, radiant body, our wise woman years, as I like to call it. I'm not a fan of the word crone, so I like to call it our wise woman years. And, and if you look at the doing and being piece, when there's when you're young, there's the most doing, then doing and being are both kind of in play in the middle. And as you get toward the last third, it's much more about being. It's less about doing at that time. And so if you've been aligned with yourself in midlife, you get to experience being in your radiance, whether or not your body is functional. I really want to stress that this is not conditional on being able to walk. This is being able to radiate a kind of wisdom, a passion. It's not as fiery as the middle part of life. It might be more quiet, but you see these women, Jane Fonda, Oprah, Helen Mirren, you know, you see these women. Iris Apfel is 102 years old and she's still out here modeling. Like you see these women who are lit up from inside. Why? Because they activated their passion earlier in life. And that's what's carrying them through into having something radiant to share with the world in this last stage of life. And I, I want to really counteract, like part of what I'm really out here working to do is to counteract this narrative that as women, we're supposed to shrivel up and disappear just because we're getting older, just because our looks are not as commanding as they used to be. Who cares? Yeah, I love that. I saw a picture of Oprah last week. I think it was celebrating her 70th birthday. And I'm like, holy moly, lady, you're looking phenomenal, but not like 
you know, what she looks like, just the energy that radiates out from her. Exactly. I think she's such a great example of what you're talking about, right? Of like the passion body. And when you really spend that time in those years, really activating that and aligning to that, then in those radiant body years, it's almost like you get to relax and lean back and like, just ride the wave kind of thing, which feels like it would be awesome. Exactly. And it does. You get to ride and rest on that at that time. But it doesn't happen automatically because here's the alternative. If you don't activate your passion in the middle of your life, if you don't do the work you and I are both currently engaged in, in terms of aligning our current life to our current desires, if you don't do that work in the middle, it doesn't automatically happen at the end. And my mother is an example of that. She, for whatever reason, didn't do that in the middle of her life. Her generation, I think, Part of it was generational. Part of it was personal makeup, you know, like her own personality. She didn't see possibility in the way that I see possibility. And so her final years were much more a dwindling and a, a shrinking of her world where she did less and less. I mean, and part of it, she had a chronic illness that made it impossible to do stuff. I mean, that's the end, the end of her life. But even before that, for years, she was, she would just sit and watch TV all day. That's basically all she did. And, you know, had she, had she had access to what I have access to as her daughter, the knowledge, the wisdom, the passion, the drive to align and to teach other women how to align with themselves. Like if she had had that, I think her elder years would have looked much different than they did. And so I want to really recognize that part of what I'm talking about is a generational shift in this generation. And we have to actively claim it. It's not a given for the next generation. It'll probably feel normal, but for us, it feels revolutionary. Right. And I think it's different. I don't have a lot of role models for this stage of my life. My mom passed away when I was nine. I don't have the older kind of female role models. So I feel a little bit like I'm not sure if I'm doing it right kind of thing. But then when I lean into what you teach and, and what you coach on, I think, well, there, okay, one, there's no right or wrong, Michelle, so that you're being ridiculous, right? But also like just being true to me tapping in and, and listening. Well, what do, what do I want? Because I think often we can get feedback or like conditioning that what we want is not important or less important. Or if we are very intentional about getting what we want, then we're considered selfish. Mm -hmm. I had to get over that. That was a big one because I still get that from some people in my life that I can't they're just in my life. I can't get rid of them. Right. <laughs> um, and they will still say you're being selfish. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up because this is one of the main things that comes up, especially, I think I hear it the most with moms, but not exclusively because we are taught as women to orient our desires around what others want. And if we have had children or if we're married, then we're orienting we, it's like, okay, what they want is most important. And I'm going to squeeze my own stuff in somewhere. It's like an afterthought. And if we decide to disrupt that structure by putting our desires first, then we're labeled as selfish immediately. And, and the perception is that we're hurting our family. Yeah, like there's this scarcity, this inbred scarcity that, well, you know, there's not enough to kind of time or whatever it is to go around that, you know, you have to put this, you know, 95% of what you've got into the other people, especially if you've got kids or the other one I see where I'm at right now is elderly parents. Oh, yes. One of my best friends cares for her elderly parents. And there's a lot of conversation around, you know, her, it usually lands on the daughter, right? That's a, 
that's the majority, right? And, you know, you try to do what you feel is right to support your parents, but then you try to, you know, take some time for yourself or prioritize yourself. And then the other people are like, well, you're supposed to be looking after them. Exactly. Well, what do you do? Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because my mother died in 2020. It wasn't from COVID, although COVID did affect her end of life care a lot because it was intense trying to navigate caregivers that were out with COVID and trying to keep her taken care of because she couldn't do anything for herself, like not one thing at that stage of her life. And her final years were an incredible struggle for me because I, I spent 15 years living, I had lived on the West Coast for 10 years in my 20s, from like 22 to 32. Then I moved back to New York because my father was dying. So I gave up a slamming private practice as an acupuncturist and a massage therapist. I was booked solid. I had my own office. I was killing it with celebrity clients and top athletes in the world as my clients. I gave all that up by choice. They didn't ask me to. I chose to do that. I'm an only child. My father mattered to me a great deal. I chose to give all that up and move back to New York. He passed away six months after I got there. I stayed back for 15 years because my mother was alone in this country, but she, she wasn't American. So that was a part, I also got married and, you know, so I did live a life on the East Coast, but, it, and, and I did do things I wanted. But in the back of my mind, it was like, I don't want my mother to be alone. And I don't want her to, you know, God forbid something happens to her and I'm not there. And finally, after 15 years, this little voice inside of me was like, I, I want to live in California. <laughs> like, can we please live in California again? And I made the very difficult decision to move back out west. And that was five years before she died. In the last five years of her life, I flew back and forth a lot. But I, I had to navigate my own inner voice saying, you're selfish for prioritizing your own happiness, for choosing yourself, for moving where you want to be happy and leaving her by herself over there. Even though she had friends, it wasn't like I was the only person in her life. But it's a very strong voice that says we should self-sacrifice for our parents. And I made sure she was always cared for. I organized an intervention. We, we needed to do an intervention with her at one point. I organized that. We flew back for that. I set up her friends to support her. I mean, there was a lot that I did from the other coast. But it, I get how hard it is to do and necessary. It's necessary to do it. Yeah, and so... You know, when I think about, you know, these years, these passion body years and how we we are working on aligning that balance between the being and doing, which I love how you describe that, because so often I'm talking to people who I'm saying, like, it's not only what you're doing. It's more about who you're being when you're doing the doing. So focus on your who you're being. I do this with my team all the time. I'm like, I'm not talking about what you're doing. I'm talking about who you're being, how you're showing up. And that affects what you do and how you do it and the results. And I think as we, in the, the kind of passion body years, as we were working on that alignment and we're understanding ourselves better and what we desire and want and accept or willing to tolerate, right? All of that. We have the opportunity to establish boundaries and then people get hella mad. Because our <laughs> lack of boundaries served them. It was good for them. Like not everybody's going to be like, oh, yippee yay, you have a more solid sense of self now. No, like that's not how, like don't expect that. Some people will cheer. And some people will shift to accommodate your stronger boundary. And those are the people you keep in your life. Some people won't shift. Some people won't welcome it. And those are the people maybe you have a little less contact with, or at least you value their opinion of you less, even if you have to keep a lot of contact with them because they're a family member, for example. But someone's reaction to our greater sense of boundaries is not the arbiter of whether we're doing it right or not. 
how we feel as we move through our day, how aligned, how much energy we, we wake up with in the morning, how much enjoyment we feel in our daily activities, the balance between the things that we really love doing and the things we kind of low key hate doing, you know, having more of the things we enjoy and fewer of the things that we low key hate. All of that is the arbiter of alignment. It's not other people's opinion. Yeah, I love that. And the way you lay this out in these kind of three phases, well, one, it sounds way better than, you know, what is it? The maiden. Maiden, mother, crone. <laughs> mother, crone. Who wants to be a crone? Like that doesn't sound good at all. So I love the wise woman, but I love the radiant body. Like I have a completely different outlook, um, having done some work with you and understanding this more. I have a completely different outlook of what this will look like in the future for me. Right. I'm so glad to hear that. And I want to talk a little bit about, well, health. I want to talk a little bit about our bodies because for, for us as women, you know, our bodies change a lot in the middle of our lives. And I'm going to tell a quick story in that, well, I was born with dysplasia, hip dysplasia that was undiagnosed. And I was very active my whole life. So by the time I was in my mid-40s, I could barely walk. I had this incredible pain. And this is part of why I wanted to move to California as I could drive because I could barely walk to the subway. I couldn't get to the subway anymore in New York. And it was really limiting me. So I thought, oh, if I move to a warmer climate, I'll have less pain. I'll be able to drive. It'll be easier. Regardless, I still was in a ton of pain. And it turned out that I had these bone spurs growing off the tip ends of my femurs that were scraping the hip joint. And so I had to get them both replaced at 50, 50 and 51 years old. And here I am in my 40s, newly single, barely able to walk, thinking nobody is ever going to want this. You know, how we talk to ourselves in our head is always meaner, right? So it was like, oh, my God. So I'm going to say something politically incorrect, but I was saying it about me to me in my head. It's like, who's going to want this crippled woman? Like, I'm, I have to count steps to know whether I'm going to make it from here to there. I literally knew how many steps I could do before I would have to stop and sit down and breathe and be able to gather my strength to continue. It took me forever to get anywhere. And here I am to say, First of all, don't wait 10 years of chronic pain to go to a doctor. <laughs> like, get the x-ray sooner than I did. I did all the spiritual healing and the thing and the energy work and the blah and the blah. And I had flipping bone spurs. Like, I needed an x-ray, but I was so stubborn trying to find a spiritual solution to my physical pain. So don't do that. If you have physical pain, do the spiritual work and the emotional work, but also get the x-ray and... Here I am in my mid-50s. I met the love of my life at that time. He didn't care that I couldn't walk. We were together through both surgeries. I was really beautifully supported by him and our friends in our community in my recover both my recoveries. And here I am at 57 years old, newly married to the love of my life who I've been with for the past eight years. I'm able to walk. I went on a two-hour hike yesterday with somebody way fitter than me, but I kept up. <laughs> so the trajectory can change. It can get better. Like I feel so much better now than I did a decade ago. Oh, me too. Oh my God. I was just thinking this the other day. I was in New York last week for a little trip, a Christmas in New York trip with some friends. And okay, there was one day I did nearly 30,000 steps. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, I feel like I walked up and down Manhattan several times. It was a long day. It was a lot. And I, I got back to my hotel room, and it was like 11 o'clock at night, and I had a shower, and I was lying in bed, and I was like, I am so grateful for my body because five years ago, my body wouldn't have been able to do this. I was a lot heavier, way overweight. I had a lot of problems with my health and breathing and energy. And I just wouldn't have been physically able to do it. I woke up in the morning and I was like, ready to go. I was like, 
Huh? Let's go. Where are we going today? Amazing. <laughs> amazing. And that, what you are experiencing now, what I'm experiencing now, both of those didn't happen by magic. They didn't happen by praying on it. They didn't happen by wishing and hoping. They happened because we both made choices, some of them very difficult and, and painful at the time. Like surgery is not fun, let me tell you. And to do it twice, way not fun. Like both of us made tough choices and changed what needed to be changed to be now having this experience where both of us feel better in our bodies. And so I just really want to land that for someone. If you're listening and you're struggling, let's say you're having hot flash, you know, whatever, if you're in the menopause journey or you're in having a physical issue that's creating difficulty for you, don't just pray and hope, like actually get the care you need, do the steps you need to take, eat the foods, that are going to be better for your system, cut back on the substances that numb you to how you're feeling so you can have an accurate read on what's actually happening. So try to stop or reduce how much time you spend numbed out so that you can, like awareness is the first step to change. First, you got to feel what you need to change and then you change it. But it's this combination of both of us prioritizing alignment and prioritizing wanting to feel better and then taking the actions to support that. And that can happen at any age. Yeah, it's so interesting, right? Because I think so often people think this is as good as it's gonna get, or, you know, I can't, like similar to you, I had thoughts not that long ago, fairly recently, like who's gonna wanna date me? right? Like I'm 54. Like I'm not a spring chicken over here. I haven't dated since 1999 kind of thing, right? Like I don't even know what dating means in today's world, right? And I was like, ah, like who's going to want that? And all of a sudden I was presented with this experience of somebody wanting to kiss me. And I I was just like, what? You what? Like I I'm trying to give the guy a high five and he's like, what are you doing right now? Like, why why are you trying to high five me? I would like to kiss you. And I was like, you want to kiss me? What? Oh, so sweet. Yeah. And it was, it was just such a it was so weird for me. I went back to my room and I was like, wow, I didn't even think that was like that wasn't on my radar. And then I'm like, wow, it's actually been a long time since somebody has kissed me. And I counted it back, I think it's seven years. I'm like, that's a long time. Wow. And so then we can ask, yeah, we can ask ourselves like, why? Why was that okay, right? Well, I was doing the work I needed to do on myself, doing that aligning work. Exactly, you were doing the work and what that story to me exemplifies so much about the magnetism that we develop as we get older. So even we have an idea in our heads of like, who'd want me? But when we're out there living life and we're turned on by what we're doing and our passion is alive and our pleasure and joy and fun and we're loving life, that's way more magnetic and attractive than the thing we were hung up on in the pretty body phase of our life, because that was all external. So from my perspective, I'm like, of course he wanted to kiss you because you were having an amazing time on this trip and you were discovering things and you were seeing beauty and you were turned on and you were loving the people on the trip and you were having fun. How could he not want to kiss you? Because you're radiant and magnetic and in, and in, your, in your joy. That's sexy. Yeah. And so I think... For anybody who's listening, one, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know, this is it. It's not, I promise you, two women here telling you it is not. Might not always be easy or comfortable to figure this shit out, but you can. And I think support is 
really important, right? To, to surround yourself with other women who prioritize this, right? And to get professional help when you need professional help. Yeah, because it's not going to come for the culture. <laughs> right? So I think there's all kinds of ways we can get help and it, it can look at a variety of different ways. But one of the biggest things that I think is to be in the vibration of it, to be surrounding your, be very intentional with who you're sharing your energy with and are they all in the way you're all in? Because then you get people, you know, you and I, we don't, we're friends. We don't talk every day, but when we do, it's like we're connected. I don't need to see you every day. I can see you next year or something. And we would still be having a great conversation because it's a frequency. Yes, exactly. I, it's just so, so important. Oh my God, this conversation was amazing. Is there anything else you want to, nuggets of gold you want to drop in there? Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned support, the types of support that someone might need as they... In, go through this process. And I'd love to share a few ways that I support women through this time. So the first, I love starting with a quiz. You, you love quizzes, I love quizzes, because quizzes help us see ourselves. So I have a really kick-ass quiz called your grown-ass power quiz. And the thing you get after you do the quiz, I like have it on my wallpaper on my computer because I'm like, that is so me and I need to embody that. So oh, I love it. So this quiz gives you one of your five passion body archetypes. And so we each have a bunch of archetypes inside, but there's always a dominant one. And this quiz will identify your dominant archetype. And then there's a bunch of follow-up, very supportive educational content about the strengths and the challenges and what to focus on. And there's a five episode private podcast that goes even deeper into the archetype. So there's a lot, a beautiful rabbit hole to support yourself with there. And should you want more active support, Michelle is a part of this. My Passion Body Hub community is a community of women who are in this moment, this inquiry. Who am I? What do I want now? What would really light me up? Where am I going? And each month I teach, we have brain training. You got to train your brain. Your subconscious mind needs to be on board with what your conscious mind comes up with. And we do specific work to help your mind be 100% aligned with your desires. That's one of the things we do in there. So you get more confidence with your decision making, you get more trust in your intuition. I also teach on communication because I have a background as a relationship coach. So you learn how to communicate these new desires more effectively with the people in your life who matter. And it's a beautifully supportive community and a great way to begin. And then should you want to dive a little bit deeper and get even more support, I offer retreats in Mexico for women where you can come and put everything down and be 100% pampered and taken care of as you take this space to uncover what you want more deeply, what would be aligned moving forward, release the blocks so that you can more effectively move, create an action plan for when you get home. So that's another level of support. And then the highest level of support would be to have the group things as well as private, customized, bespoke coaching packages that I offer. And, you know, if you really want to move fast, do a combination of group and private because then that's the most customized. So that's what's available. I love that. Do the assessment, get into the hub. That's like the easiest thing to do. That's what I did. And then you can just, start to play with it and explore deeper, right? Like it's so good. So, so good. Thank you so much for sharing this. I just, so important when we think about our rich life, like what does that mean for us? Even like our own internal revolution, the, I, the concept I have around the rich life revolution and the passion body time period is just, they go so well together. It's phenomenal. So if there's any way that I can help people really lean into this, I want to do that. So for you to come here and share this today is amazing. Thank you so much. 
I so appreciate the opportunity to share. And I love, I love Rich Life Revolution. Like it is super aligned because we are talking very much about the similar thing, about who we're being, how we're engaging with life. What is abundance? What is richness in the deeper sense? What is your rich life? Yeah, yeah. I noticed because I was just at a conference in LA and I noticed a reaction from younger people when you say rich life revolution, they think money. Money, money, money all day long. You say that to somebody in the passion body era and they actually think a health and relationship. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, like it's different. And so it just totally aligns with what you were saying, right? Yeah, that's the difference between the pretty body perspective and the passion body perspective. Totally. I love that. Awesome. Well, we'll put everything in the show notes so people can get hooked up with the assessment and, you know, the hub and all that stuff. And just, I'm so grateful for you, really, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you too. Thank you so much. Thanks for spending time with me today. I love this episode, love Marie Elizabeth's work. And really the thing that jumped out at me most, my big aha, my light bulb moment was accepting and embracing the fluidity of alignment. I kind of felt like I'm like an all or nothing kind of gal. And so I kind of felt like alignment is like, I'm either in alignment or I'm out of alignment. And I didn't ever consider the fluidity of alignment. So that was my game changer. That was my aha, my light bulb moment. And I would love to hear what your aha moment was and what you're taking away from this episode. Do you resonate with the pretty body, the passion body, and the radiant body? Does that speak to you? Because it does to me. I love the idea of living in my passion body, and I can't wait to get to my radiant body. Sounds amazing to me. So. Be sure to share on social media, like our podcast, download it, review it, give it some stars, give it some love, and take the grown ass power quiz that Elizabeth is providing to us. It's in the show notes. So make sure you check that out. In next week's episode, I'm going to be jamming out on the power of transformative travel. So be sure to tune in and check it all out. Thanks for hanging out with me. I hope you got at least one gold nugget today. Be sure to grab your copy of the Rich Life Revolution workbook to help you set the foundation for your next level of wealthy. Get it now at richliferevolution.ca and I'll see you later.